From the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador, I am Estefania Bravo. This is From the South, and we extend a special welcome to our viewers in Antigua and Barbuda. We begin in Venezuela, where over 300 participants from 95 countries are taking part in the We Are All Venezuela event in solidarity with the Bolivarian Revolution. The event is also paying homage to Hugo Chavez five years after his passing. Venezuela's Foreign Minister Jorge Arreaza explained how Chavez has always been an inspiration to him. He gave much more than the world and people can see, this, this, this kind of literature at this moment in history. He gave so much more than the imper imperialist tendencies can say. And he did this while alive. But uh, Chavez was always was something tangible. And after he, his speech in February 4th, 1992, maybe his second, maybe I am one minute, no more than that. We had what the media called the myth of Hugo Chavez. Workers, students, intellectuals, grassroots movement activists, and other friends of Venezuela attended the Somos Venezuela Solidarity event in Caracas. Many said they want to celebrate and show gratitude for Venezuela's support. We are here uh, to celebrate with the people and to commemorate the death of the anniversary, fifth anniversary of Hugo Chavez. And we stand in solidarity with the revolution. Different countries, a lot of people with different uh, mindsets, a lot of different um, programs. So we could see how we can uh, try to help Venezuela and give support to them. You said you were study, was it studying in Venezuela before? Can you, what were you doing here? Well, I studied health and physical activities in the Cojere state. And you, you've taken your skills back to your home country, I presume? Yes, I've taken it back and I give thanks to Venezuela. I give thanks to the Venezuelan Prime Minister or Venezuelan President for his support towards the Caribbean countries and also to Dominica. And others came with a specific mission to change mindsets. Some members of the Canadian delegation said that the world is getting the wrong message about the reality of the Bolivarian Revolution and what it stands to do. Well, for me personally, I came because, you know, I live in a country that right now is pretty well leading the charge against Venezuela. Canada is one of the, you know, a, a country that has imposed sanctions and is leading the Lima group and is completely misleading Canadians on the real issues that are in Venezuela. And so I think it's important for me as a Canadian to be here to take the message back to other Canadians that a lot of the information we're reading in the press and seeing in the TV and released by the foreign uh, minister is incorrect information in regards to Venezuela. And by standing up for a socialist future, Venezuela is empowering its women to get involved in politics, uh, to protect mothers, uh, to protect uh, young women, older women. Um, and these are huge gains um, that we want to see not only for women in Venezuela, um, but for poor and working women all over the world. I'm here today to show solidarity with Venezuela because I believe that every country has a right to govern in its own capacity without the outside interference of other countries because we see that um, in the past that the intervention of other countries, especially the bigger nations with brute force and fascism has caused world wars. The countries of the Bolivarian Alliance of the Peoples for Our America, also known as ALBA, also paid homage to Hugo Chavez when they met in Caracas for their 15th summit. The meeting expressed support for Venezuela against foreign interference and pledged to work for a new world order. Long live Chavez legacy. Long live homeland independence and Bolivarian socialism. With this firm message, the 15th Alba TCP summit began in the Venezuelan capital, Caracas, on Monday. The meeting coincided with the fifth anniversary of the death of the father of the Bolivarian revolution, Hugo Chavez. It was Chavez's visionary idea to start Alba in 2004. One by one, leaders of Latin American and Caribbean states arrived at the beautifully decorated Mina Flores Presidential Palace in the heart of the city. 
Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro warmly welcomed the leaders and thanked them for their support. Amongst the most prominent attendees were Cuba's President Raul Castro, Bolivian President Evo Morales, Nicaraguan President Daniel Ortega, Dominica's Prime Minister and Puerto Rico's independence leader, Oscar Lopez Rivera. Launching the summit, Maduro asked the member nations to make stronger efforts towards their goal of regional alliance. ALBA is in a place to move forward through working mechanisms that are more fixed. We should draw out of this summit the need to meet regularly, to work through our agenda and make our decisions so we can progress on a vital economic, social, cultural, diplomatic and geopolitical action of Latin America and the Caribbean and the rest of the world. President of Nicaragua, Daniel Ortega, also supported Maduro's pledge in his current fight for peace and for the welfare of the Latin American people. We are totally sure, convinced, that the seed that Fidel and Chavez planted that seed has sprouted fruit already and continues to multiply, it's sprouting more fruit. And today, this practice of gathering to establish the norms of exchange with real justice is what our America, our Latin America and Caribbean demands in order to eradicate poverty and to be truly free and independent. The Prime Minister of Dominica, Roosevelt Skerritt, said Alba had given a better sense of identity in the region of the Caribbean and Latin America. All of our countries Members of Petro Caribe have seen han podido ver los beneficios tangibles que estos problemas, programas han llevado a nuestros pueblos. En gran medida, Petro Caribe ha ayudado a reducir la pobreza en nuestra región. Ha creado acceso a la salud para todos los ciudadanos y también ha permitido acceso a la educación. By the end of the summit, all the delegates agreed to promote the development of a new world order that is fair, multi-centered and pluricultural, as opposed to the hegemonic alternative with its unilateral tendencies. They also unanimously rejected foreign interference in Venezuela and they pledged to carry on the legacy of their great leader, Hugo Chavez. All across the region, countries continue to commemorate the fifth death anniversary of Hugo Chavez. This is what Nicaragua is doing to remember the Venezuelan revolutionary. Since Tuesday, from Bolivar to Chavez Avenues, as well as other places in the capital like the National Palace, supporters of Hugo Chavez gathered to honor his memories and thoughts. We celebrate life because Chavez is born every day in Nicaragua and in Latin America's youth. In this coordinator's meeting, we reaffirm our love for Chavez, for Venezuela, and our compromise to advance towards prosperity in 2018, with higher quality for education. But apart from that, we do this to learn and to progress. In the Technical Industrial Center, named after him, more than 3,000 youngsters have scholarships supported by ALBA. They homage Chavez with music and color. Melina is one of them. She will graduate in design, cut and confection along with 23 other people. I wasn't able to get to know him in person, but I'm getting to know him now with all of these programs and scholarships. Here in Nicaragua, I've been able to use many different scholarships, and that has helped me a lot because I now have a job in spite of being a student. I also work as a seamstress and designer in my own workshop. Orlando Núñez is a sociologist and he tells us that Chavez was a great leader who achieved union of Latin American countries. I will say that he was the first leader who worked as a bridge between the Caribbean, Central America and South America. Nicaragua joined ALBA in 2007, and since then, they strengthened bilateral relations with Venezuela. Chavez visited this country many times, and his legacy is everywhere.
The National Electoral Council of Venezuela, or CNE, has announced that five candidates will run for presidency in the upcoming elections scheduled for May 20th. The head of the CNE, Socorro Hernández, confirmed that the candidates are Reinaldo Quijada, Javier Bertucci, Alejandro Ratti, and Henry Falcón. Falcón is the main opponent running against President Nicolás Maduro. Candidates agreed last week to respect the results of the elections. We'll take a short break now. Join us again after this look at what our multimedia colleagues are reporting. We're making incredible progress. The women's unemployment rate hit the lowest level that it's been in 17 years. Women are doing great. For real? For real? Let's talk about the job situation in your country, President Trump. In the United States, the following professions are at least 80% female. Teachers, nurses, secretaries, and healthcare. These female-dominated professions are essential, but not well-paid or high status. Women dominating lower paid jobs is a huge problem because it leaves many in a tough financial position. Equal workload should mean equal payment, but in real life, that's not the case. Studies show that in the U.S., women only earn as much as men if they are a dental hygienist, HR specialist, or advertising salesperson. A lot of career options, right? Trump thinks it's fine, though, because as long as this capitalist patriarchal system is in the run, women, the LGBT community, and people of color will keep on being exploited and affected by it. Welcome back. 11 countries will sign the new Trans-Pacific Trade Agreement, or CPTPP, in the Chilean capital, Santiago, on Thursday. The deal is set to slash tariffs among member nations by 2019. The pact impacts 500 million people and represents 13% of the world's gross domestic product. The United States withdrew from the trade pact, claiming it would hurt their companies and take jobs away. This will be Chilean President Michelle Bachelet's last international public event before leaving office on Sunday. Bachelet has also said that she will send Congress legislation to replace the Constitution before she steps down. Proposed changes will include guaranteed equal pay for men and women, as well as the right for workers to go on strike. Chile's current constitution dates back to the right-wing military dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet. Although significant changes have been made since their return to democracy, Bachelet and others have argued that it must be rewritten from scratch. In Brazil, a request from the lawyers of former President Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva that he should stay out of prison has been turned down. Earlier this year, the fourth regional federal court confirmed Lula's conviction and increased his sentence to 12 years. The state prosecutor is now requesting that Lula start serving his sentence for corruption immediately. Our correspondent in Brasilia sends us this report. At the Superior Justice Tribunal here in Brasilia, the trial of ex-president Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva has been taking place. Lula had requested a habeas corpus to avoid prison until every legal resource in every instance can be processed. While this happens inside the court, a group of citizens here in the capital have come out to show their support for Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva. Actually, one of the most used hashtags on social media is Lula Libre. That is the feeling of the Brazilian people. It is known that Lula still has the largest amount of supporters. This is Brazil's feeling and this is how they express it to the Superior Justice Tribunal. Thank you for that report. Still in Brazil, members of trade unions demonstrated outside the U.S. consulate in Sao Paulo. They are protesting against U.S. President Donald Trump's import surcharge on Brazilian steel and are trying to defend their jobs. Since last week's announcement of a plan to impose a 25% tariff on steel imports and 10% on aluminum, Trump has been criticized by many nations, including China, Canada, Brazil, and Mexico, among others. 
Brazil's Supreme Court has lifted the ban on access to President Michel Temer's bank records. The ruling granted by Judge Luis Roberto Barroso gives investigators permission to use the records to build a case against the head of state. Federal police will now have access to financial transactions made between January 2013 to June 2017. On March 11th, Colombians will choose their senators and lawmakers for the next four years. Political analysts are warning that the country faces many challenges. The head of the mission for electoral observation, Alejandra Barrios, said the new Congress will face a huge task to maintain the agreements achieved through the peace process and to push for reforms of the judicial system. We are talking about a big political reform that will allow the democratization of the country, a reform of the justice system to break the circle of impunity among political groups and those who have the responsibility to make justice. Will the new Colombian Congress be able to face these challenges? Many are skeptical. Political researchers and activists point out that around 60 candidates are under investigation for corruption or other related felonies. The chances of them being elected are high. All the 48 lawmakers seriously linked with corruption are going to be elected, according to the data we have, or they will choose their sons or cousins. At least 40% of Congress will be in the hands of corruption, mobs, or sectors opposed to any kind of reform towards peace. This could bring disastrous effects for Colombia. What does this mean? That the reforms designed to end corruption or give land to the people are meant to fail. The Electoral Observation Mission says there are 170 Colombian municipalities that risk fraud or violence. However, it is also concerned about the political dogma in the electoral process. Perhaps one of the bigger risks in this electoral campaign is the general intolerance. Citizens are not able to express themselves despite their different ideas and point of view. This complex scenario is proven by the absence of guarantees for the political participation of alternative and progressive forces. Next Sunday, Colombians will have to decide if they want to play the game of democracy and inclusion or choose the nepotism and the corruption of traditional politics. The medical staff in charge of Colombian presidential candidate Rodrigo Londoño says his health has deteriorated since he was admitted to the hospital last week. The former FARC leader, also known as Timochenko, had a heart attack last Thursday. He was scheduled to undergo surgery, and doctors are trying to control Londoño's pulmonary and vascular complications. A centuries-old Lang Act in Antigua is to become a key issue in the general election. Some citizens say they are prepared to sue the government over a new law that allows land to be sold for tourism development and rebuilding the island. After Hurricane Irma destroyed most of Barbuda's infrastructure, the government of Antigua and Barbuda said it was considering changing a centuries-old law that gives Barbudans communal ownership of the island's land and use private equity to fund the rebuilding effort. Mexico is looking into ways to deepen energy cooperation with Jamaica, Mexico's foreign minister said in Kingston on Tuesday. Luis Videgaray, who's on a two-day trip to the Caribbean island, added that he was hoping to get more Mexican firms to come to Jamaica as potential investors. He also said Mexico would be signing a memorandum of understanding with Jamaica to provide technical support to the island's oil refinery. Petrojam, which is jointly owned by a subsidiary of Petróleos de Venezuela S.A. And as International Women's Day approaches, dozens of Venus signs have been installed in a park in Mexico City as a symbol of the victims of femicides in the country. The Venus signs are made to look like headstones in a cemetery, representing the growing number of women murdered. Organizers hope the installation pressures the Mexican government to act on reports of violence. Homicides of women have risen by a nearly quarter under President Enrique Peña Nieto, especially as Mexico's total murder tally has recently reached its highest levels. 
Pope Francis has approved a miracle attributed to Salvadoran Archbishop Oscar Romero, clearing him the way for him to become a saint. Romero was gunned down by right-wing death squads during El Salvador's military dictatorship in 1980. Pope Francis declared him a martyr in 2015 and unblocked his sainthood case, setting him on the path to canonization. Romero was Archbishop of San Salvador at the start of El Salvador's 1979-1992 Civil War. We'll take a short break now. Join us again after this look at what our multimedia colleagues are reporting. Welcome back. Russia's foreign ministry has said that Britain's attempt to link them to the mysterious illness of a double agent is inappropriate. The ministry also said the accusation could damage the relations between London and Moscow. Former Russian double agent Sergei Skripal and his daughter fell critically ill when they were exposed to an unknown substance in southern England on Sunday. What has happened to Skripal was immediately used to whip up an anti-Russian campaign in the Western media. Even before the situation was clarified, traditional wild guesses started spreading. Moreover, a concerted action is obvious in the whole campaign. President Donald Trump's top economic advisor, Gary Cohn, has put in his resignation papers. Cohn resigned over his disagreement with Trump on increased tariffs on steel and aluminum imports to the U.S. Cohn is a firm supporter of free trade. He says Trump's decision would lead to a trade war. His resignation comes just a week after White House Communications Director Hope Kicks announced her departure. And we've come to the end of this morning's news brief. These and many other stories, you can find them on our website at telesurtv.net slash English. And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Telesur English, I am Estefania Bravo. Thank you for watching.